move on to chapter five, and this chapter uh, deals with diversity and the diversity, how it's impacted our schools and impacting teachings. And one of the things that diversity indicates that we sometimes forget is diversity not only it means cultural diversity, but diversity in uh, kids with disabilities and kids that are uh, from poverty and anybody that fits outside that realm of uh, what we call normal. And of course now there's a bunch of federal legislation uh, that it came about because of these, uh, uh, these diversity issues. And so let's take a look at Chapter 5, Diversity. So we're still in Part 2 of our uh, endeavor, and it deals with uh, Chapter 5, How Has uh, Diversity Impacted Teaching? And so let's go ahead and uh, take a look. One of the most dramatic changes in education has been increased diversity of students. Uh, it's, it seems like a trite statement, but in my time, a lot of these diverse students, number one, we didn't have as many immigrants in our country. Number two, when I was in school, we didn't include the kids with special needs. And number three, uh, the minor or the impoverished kids weren't as impoverished. That I went to school with poor kids, but uh, somewhat different than today. So as I said earlier, the diversity really includes uh, uh, different groups, one being the, the ethnic group, and then language group, and ability group. And so let's, uh, let's move on from there. Uh, ethical and radical uh, and racial diversity has increased significantly over the last 30 years. And of course, the thing that's interesting about 30, that's exactly how long I've been out of school. The largest percentage of increase has been in Hispanic enrollment as they represent 19% of the public school enrollment. Okay, 19%. To me that's a little shocking that 19% of the kids in our public schools today are Hispanic. It has been the fastest growing immigration group in the history of our country. And the other thing is so uh, different than any other immigration we've had in the history of our country is this immigration was from south to north. Every other immigration was from east to west, some west to east, but this one was south to north. But that, that just shocks me that that could be accurate, that 19% of our public school kids are Hispanic. You want to prepare yourself to be a teacher? Learn Spanish. Language diversity results from more than 1 million immigrants from the, that enter the U.S. every year. It's projected that by 2020, the foreign-born population of the U.S. will be one in seven people. Okay, by 2020. So that's high, one million immigrants a year. Interesting, in a time we're talking about how hard up our country is that we'll have a million new people enter each year. Ability diversity has increased as a result of federal legislation directed at teaching of special populations. As a result, no child left behind Right here, legislation, students with special needs are placed in learn, least restrictive environments and that other, and often means a regular classroom. Okay. So here's the focus questions and these are in your textbook also. What advantages and challenges of increased student diversity? How do you prepare for the diversity you will encounter as a teacher and why did the social movement uh, disintegration impact education? When do you alter instruction methods and materials to meet these needs? Which activities help to develop cultural and ethnic pride and uh, offensive? So this uh, takes us to the video viewpoint on students being hungry. And with that, uh, this I also have a, a discussion question that you'll respond to about being hungry. And that is, did, after you watch this video, did you know anybody that was hungry? And what's your responsibility as of being hungry, uh, you know, to kids that are hungry? So don't do this now, but at the end, make sure you view this on uh, students being hungry. So multicultural education. It's a big buzz, I think, on, um, at times I think we get over-focused on this, uh, but it'll also be a huge part of your job that you'll, find that in your classrooms uh, a third of the kids fit in this category uh, as multicultural uh, and diverse and you'll spend two-thirds of your time working with this one-third of the group. Multicultural is education that promotes education equity 
equity and that's the thing because for a long time they were kind of a forgotten group so the buzz will be equity culturally appropriate practices means methods culture appropriate environment and how do you assure that you have uh, culturally appropriate practices and, and environments well it starts with your awareness of those environments this is out of your textbook on page 12 a culturally responsive environment is you know accepting uh, learners experiences and values and tastes alternating instruction uh, and selecting texts novels and other reading materials that meet needs and academic needs uh, encourage acceptance of students that native speech patterns acknowledge the cultural heritage of other groups develop ethnic and cultural pride and you see some of our schools having different cultural days and stuff like that that schools entire schools have tried to find ways to make this a, a more inviting thing and then what is that multicultural lear learning and of course this is on 112 again and there's some keys in here uh, first of all you, you consider your own experience uh, of learning and then uh, you develop certain expectations well cult some cultures have different expectations this created a difference between teacher expectations and student expectations these differences can have students can leave students torn between two sets of authority figures and who are those two force them to choose between pleasing their teachers and their families oh and I can't tell you how that'll be conflicting uh, for you at times because your uh, approach and your attitude will be that of a middle uh, class uh, person uh, middle class teacher uh, you know with a kind of a European background and these folks will have different ones this potential disconnect between teachers and prospective learners perspective is growing although most teachers are white and middle class students are more radical racially and linguistically diverse for example this is old that um, this is old that 99 2000 school year 86 percent of book school teachers and administrators were were white but projections indicate that in 2026 non-white k-12 enrollment will be 70 percent okay so 86 percent of teachers are white but 70 percent of the kids are, are not white so we'd like some kind of a balance so the need for accurate information and there's several views let me just take you quickly take you to this section on accurate information where it talks about uh, boys and girls and please read this on page 112 but you a genetic deficit view is that you believe certain groups are predisposed to fail or a cultural deficit is you have that lack of stimulation in homes because it causes one to fail and this is what we do with kids of, from poverty a little bit say you know uh, because of home they're going to fail and then this communication process position minority group language patterns cause poor academic performance make sure you read this uh, because we assume for example genetics says boys obviously boys will never lead to learn to read and write like girls obviously girls will never be able to learn math and science like boys some of those archaic uh, approaches to this and then uh, we tend to carry this off in school and if one of the solutions to this is your awareness of it well then we had some uh, influence of desegregation in our schools and this is how uh, this came to be including these kids in our school and there is uh, two three four five six of these and you are going to investigate the impact they had on a project on the wiki site and it's right here under uh, uh, issue issue inclusion and it's these folks right up here um, right here and what you'll do and I gave you a little example of it is you will put in a little thing on what impact this legislation had what it was and what it did just short and sweet 
an image and again this is for us visual learners always some kind of a picture here and then a link a support material this you can get you can take from the textbook if you like but you got to have at least one other link that talks about it and then an image and remember to put a picture in here you can't copy cannot copy and paste you have to download the picture and upload it to put it in here and then resize it to get full credit for this Okay, so you're going to determine that impact and you will bring this in uh, to uh, how um, these things helped with uh, desegregation and what impact they had on the school. So a, a statement about what they are and how they impact the school. And some of these are quite obvious, like busing. Now, I shouldn't say obvious because you don't remember busing, but there was a time uh, I kind of give this away that the busing was about uh, we wanted to integrate uh, kids of minority groups into our regular school so we put kids on buses and drove them for an hour or two across town so the black kids could go to the white school only to find it didn't work at all <laughs> it didn't work at all it had a lot of problems and then these gender issues uh, inequalities uh, experienced by female students and males uh, and again, you'll want to read this, but again, it's stating here that, you know, there was this underlying attitude that, that female students weren't as good in math and science. Male students what is, weren't as good at reading and writing. Mm -hmm. And again, just some awareness of that helps. Uh, a big thing now in single uh, gender schools, uh, and the research is coming more clear that uh, students tend to do better in the single gender schools, but uh, it's not real popular. Uh, and I don't mean not only with the kids, but with politically, it's it's not real uh, popular. So it, it's kind of died. But uh, there's a number of schools around, and it's especially boarding schools that serve just one gender or another. So that's come into play. Well, how about goals and suggestions for teachers? Uh, and here's some basic things. Again, you believe that all can learn. You modify the practices, accommodate learning style differences. Learn about diversity, reflect on your own perspective, rely less on standardized tests, avoid class favorites. And again, you're going to do some of this on the wiki. And so let's take a quick at that, look at that so that you know what that's going to be. And that's just a little farther down here where it comes like this. These groups right here. And again, you come in here uh, and, and put in what this means and then a little image of it, and then some kind of a link that supports it. And I know this link will be a stretch. It may be hard to find this, but if you understand these topics here, if you get an understanding of that, you should be able to find some kind of an image that supports that. I say the link will be a little bit of a stretch. You may or may not find something real solid that supports this, but do the best you can. But it's this group from here uh, to here that fall into this category. And again, like I say, if you're doing an image, you have to download it and upload it. You can't paste it in here. And some of you have struggled with that. Okay. So, and then providing good teachers, and this is interesting, I think. And we don't people are afraid to talk about this because again, it's not very politically friendly to say. But a central ingredient in good schools is still good teachers. Yet the learners with most need quality teachers are least likely to get them. Now, why is that? Why is that? Well. Teachers in predominantly minority schools tend to be less experienced, teaching other field, and holding emergency teaching certificates in lieu of normal qualifications. Why are they holding uh, emergency teaching certificates? Because they didn't have the, the credential in the area that need, they need a teacher. So for example, I'm teaching in a downtown school where their kids come from uh, more po impoverished areas. They, you have lots of kids in that school that have free and reduced lunches, uh, very diverse group. Uh, learning is, is uh, you know, they, they struggle with their scores. Well, what happens? Well, first of all, they the people that come there for the most part uh, are uh, hired late. They generally uh, don't have, they're young, they're out just in their first job because as soon as they get a few years, they tend to move to more affluent schools. Why? Well, it tends to be a little easier. Uh, you get kids that f are more like you, that fit more in your uh, set of values and approaches and backgrounds, 
and so they move out of there quickly. And then I'm also, say for example, I want a Spanish teacher. I can't get anybody that has a Spanish credential to come down here, so I end up certifying somebody in a, an emergency setting to come down here. Okay, they come down here and they end up getting their credential over the next few years. The first thing they want to do is move to a more prominent school. And so one of the things you find continually in schools that are most diverse, come from low income areas, is that the staff is young, relatively few years of experience, and often under underqualified to teach what they're teaching. And so it's kind of alarming because we know, research goes on and on and on, is that the, the teacher is still uh, the most important factor in learning. And, and so uh, to have good teachers, and not that these folks aren't good teachers, but they certainly at times don't have the experience and the credentials that you want them to have in these low-income schools, hence sometimes compounds the problem. Well, let's move into exceptional learners. Exceptional learners generally deviate markedly from the norm. They uh, include gifted and talented, and a lot of times people don't realize that, but gifted is also considered part of this exceptional learner, as well as those with learning disabilities, physical problems, emotional behavior difficulties. Exceptional learners are protected by federal legislation. Yes, that's right. This is a little jump to your SPED 100 learning, and that is that this is a, a special class. They enjoy rights and privileges that others in the school do not. And that's really interesting because for the most part, in our public schools, we'd say this can't happen, but this group has some special things. So federal relation requires to have these things, zero rejects, non-discriminatory testing, appropriate education, individualized education plans, research environment, due process, parent guardian participation, mainstreaming, and this again will be a project for you on the wiki. And let me just take you out there now to see what this is. And it comes down here a little farther. And it starts here. Okay. And again, mine fit into it, the uh, Guardian. I want you to give me a description of these two things, what they are and what they mean to the school. And again, sort and sweet, so it looks like mine, just a couple statements. An image over here that you've downloaded and uploaded, and a link. And there again, there will be hundreds or maybe thousands of links dealing with these topics, unlike the ones right above it. So I expect this to be a nice looking page that we can all study from. Okay. Federal legislation, like zero rejects is just what it says, is based on the Timothy case, uh, Timothy versus the Board of Education, where the mother wanted the little uh, severely disabled child in school, and the school board, the superintendent told him, no, we don't have uh, anything, that this child won't benefit from being in school. But the mother certainly uh, knew her rights, that the child had a right to uh, a FAPE, a free and appropriate public education, and it went to court, and years later was found that, in federal legislation put in their zero rejects, that no student for any cause or reason can be rejected from from school. And that's not only, uh, you realize you are still uh, a child that has committed crimes and stuff or entitled to a FAPE. Yeah, I mean, no one is, is rejected. And then uh, also from that federal legislation it requires a variety of educational settings. And we call this a continuum of uh, studies, a continuum of placements. So what, there I changed it to a continuum of placement. And this is just a term that you want to be familiar with if you're uh, ever going to speak intelligently about uh, this process, is that all schools have to have a continuum of placements to offer kids with special needs. Okay, And so uh, special classes, uh, again, really there's one before this, I guess the thinking here is it's not part of the federal law, but the least restrictive of placements is obviously the regular classroom. And what that means is, for the most part, kids, regardless of their disability, are going to spend time in the regular classroom with you. And then, of course, we have special classes, which is what we call like resource room, and then a separate public school facility, and then a separate private school facility, 
and publicly supported residential facilities. Residential meaning they live there. Put that residential. And then private residential facilities. And then like homebound or hospital for more severe kids that are not well enough or strong enough to be in school, they still are entitled to a FAPE. FAPE meaning free and appropriate public education. Okay. So they have to, uh, federal legislation says all schools have to have a FAPE. This is what's interesting about closing uh, some talk in South Dakota about closing the school for the deaf. In some of the, uh, the, the media got let people come, parents come on there and just cry about what would we do without these services. No one said they wouldn't have these services. Federal legislation says they have to have these services that these School for Deaf provides. What they didn't say, what this federal legislation doesn't say, is that you have to have a special school for it that could easily be included with another program. And so I, I thought the media did a horrible job reporting that because the services aren't going away. The school may go away, but the services will be offered from somewhere. They may look different, but they'll still be available. Uh, how about these requirements for IEP? And again, we're a leap into SPED 100 here, but uh, what is that IEP? Well, that's an individual education plan. And if a child is found to have a disability or some learning need that prevents them from uh, really learning the curriculum or accessing the school like others, they're entitled to an IEP, an individual education plan. And it's developed soon after the learner's condition is verified, must include the learner's regular teacher, one or both parent guardians, non-teacher, usually a counselor, team must meet at least annually to discuss their progress. And I just pulled this off of your, out of your textbook now that talks about that. Okay. And you'll want to study because there's some questions. And this is how to alter, this is part of inclusion. How do you alter some of the needs and how do you uh, um, uh, serve these kids? And it talks about this, uh, you know, how do you make assessments to uh, things like, um, you know, assessment procedures where you can give the directions orally, remove them, time limits, uh, all these things. And what about assignments? Well, here's a series of things for that. Uh, directions, here's a series of modifications you make for that. Uh, grading, uh, you know, if you need to make modifications to the grading, here's a, some ways to do that. And I thought the textbook gave a nice little summation of this. And then what about reporting of this performance? Uh, and this has changed, and this is, again is out of your textbook. Past May school districts either excused these special students from taking standardized tests or did not report their scores. And this is the, what was the, the way to deal with standardized tests in the past is you either didn't count the scores or those students just happened not to be there the day you gave the tests. The current practice of forcing schools to administer or report these test scores encourages schools to expose these students to the same curriculum as non-challenged peers. So in other words, start to hold them to a higher standard. That was the whole idea behind No Child Left Behind in 2001. That, uh, uh, that you know, really uh, created some real problems for President Bush. But what this is what he was trying to do. Added important legislation to support improving the learning of students with disability. This law requires school districts to provide information each year to the performance of a subgroup. And this is what subgroups was what they felt the federal uh, group felt was missing. That we underreported these subgroups within the general population, including learners with disabilities. is made to ensure that low achieving achievements of learners in certain subgroups like not only disabilities but ethical and uh, racial minorities, economic disadvantaged learners were not hidden among scores of schools entire population makes us accountable to the progress of student special learners as you are for all others learners in the class. And like I say, we, all, we found all kinds of ways to get around this in the past. So finally this piece of legislation, No Child Left Behind, was to try and shine light on these subgroups. And of course, the president took a beating over that. So here's some inclusion issues like arguments for supporting it, arguments opposing it, and what research says about it. Uh, and the Council for Exceptional Children, what, uh, what I want you to do now is you tell me right here in this area what do you say about this area? I want you to come back and have one, a couple things about each of these, about uh, support uh, of it, opposing inclusion, and then a few uh, statements about what research says about those two things, and then what do you think about it. It's on page 125 is where this was. So right here in the notes, you need to make some uh, 
uh, observations of yourself here. You may want to do that now. Okay, and I'll be looking for this when you turn in notes. All right. And then also, right after that, I want you to read this A Day in the Life on page 127 and respond to these things, you know, uh, one and two, what d dispositions are of critical importance uh, in high-stress situations and what dispositions are reflected in Pat's actions here. So you get to do that on page 127. Then it goes into this characteristics of the different disabilities, and some of these are pretty self-explanatory. And you're, you're, again, you're going to study these in SPED 100 and certainly become more aware of them. A number of things in assistive technology are individual pieces of equipment or complex systems of equipment designed to maintain or improve the functional capabilities of learners. Uh, assistive technology also helps learners organize their work, take notes, prepare one written response assignments, uh, access reference materials, change, uh, change information formats to meet special needs. And the most common piece of that is these uh, uh, laptops or more specifically the tablets. And what we're seeing is these things are becoming smaller, sleeker, I think it will become a lot more affordable. We have a number, of course, in, in South Dakota, a number of high schools that already have them, and I think you'll see it expand more and go down farther into grades. We're, uh, we're finding that these little pieces of, of, of technology, uh, uh, laptops or tablets, uh, can kind of level the playing field because of some of the things they can do. Well, what does this mean, this over-representation of minorities? and I've had students that weren't sure what that means, but what that means is that there's more uh, representation in special ed of these than there should be. For example, uh, the one the textbook gets carried away with, I thought, was African Americans. They account for 14.5% of the school population. Remember we said the Spanish kids were 19? Well, 14.5 are African Americans. African Americans, but they account for 20% of special ed kids. So see, that's an over-representation. If it was a normal representation, if uh, your school had 14% uh, African Americans, then it shouldn't, should only have 14% of kids uh, in special ed or that are African Americans. And if there's more, it's called an over-representation. Okay, in schools with high expectations for all students, there is no over-representation of Afri uh, excuse me, African Americans in your um, uh, a textbook talks about that. And this here talks about that over representation either also. Uh, like African American or American Indian Alaska Native uh, type here, they represent 1.3 percent of kids having disabilities but only 1 percent of our population. And Asian, uh, 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 we've said this before, only 1.8 Asian, but they represent 3.8 percent of the kids. Then African uh, um, kids here, uh, again, it says 20 percent of them are not in this. Latino, where they represent 16. And then white kids, it's interesting, they represent 62 percent of kids on IEPs, but 64 percent of the student body. So which group is missing? Why didn't we come back to those Hispanic kids? Why isn't that on here? And gifted. They say this is a special group, uh, just like kids with learning needs, as they need special instruction. They have outstanding intellectual ability or creative talent, and the development of which requires special activities or services not ordinarily provided. And this uh, also, the textbook, that selection process, uh, pressures facing those learners, and that pressure, of course, is um, to, to, to be the best, never to be, make a mistake, to be flawless, to the point where they have some of these kids that don't want to be identified as having being gifted. And that selection process went back and talked about, uh, let, me, let, me, uh, let me go out here. Here's the part on the selection process that uh, it used to be always an IQ test, uh, but today, uh, you know, they use a much broader thing to pick those. In the 70s, when so many schools had this, uh, the thing was not to have more than 3% uh, of the kids, uh, you know, identified as being gifted. And uh, over the years, that you know, a lot of political pressure to expand that. 
and then of course some of these programs used to have money for this but uh, their school boards got really reluctant to allocate money for that special 3% of the kids uh, and so currently programs are gifted in only a few states serve fewer than 6% of the students some states programs are enrolled more than 14% in this and that was a way to get the funding back but it was never mandated and so uh, the feds never mandated it so a lot of schools dropped it when things got tough um, and it talks here about this uh, you know, uh, sometimes classmates encourage their gifted peers to do less. That was uh, was part of their um, thing, and, and those pressures were great. Then uh, these enriching programs, uh, usually they have one or two approaches, an enrichment approach or, uh, or an acceleration program is what really was the two approaches to gifted. And then uh, ultimately it uh, was about uh, developing, you know, their their to their potential. Okay. And yeah, if you'd make one statement about each of these things in your notes right here, that would be excellent, also. Okay. So let's, uh, you know, who influenced your views? This reflections: How will you affect your treatment? How will you help students with very cultural, ethic, social background? And again, like I said, uh, folks. You're, this is what, you know, it's coming. The thing that's good for you is that you grew up in this school also. They, these kids, this will be more normal to you than it was would be for me. How should school district leaders deal with pressure to fund certain categories of learners? Response providing a high quality education. How we respond to critics who are arguing that gifted learners are already advantaged? And that's, that's an interesting uh, thing there. And, and here's my bias on that. And of course, uh, please disagree with this, but uh, it was hard for me, uh, being with a special ed background, it was hard for me uh, to get very excited about uh, the gifted programs because I thought often those enrichment uh, type things that were provided would have benefited all kids. And what it kind of bugged me was that if they were uh, more intelligent than others, they were entitled to more enrichment type things than the other kids, even though the other kids would have benefited from that greatly. So that's chapter five, diversity. Thanks.